Hello everybody. So today's video is kind of a follow-up to yesterday's video where I pointed out how Stoneco uh, was really dirt cheap from an EBITDA yield standpoint as well as from a forward revenue growth standpoint and how much we're paying for that forward revenue growth. So if you're used to the channel, you'll see that the channel's usual metrics here on that, that spreadsheet that I've copied up to enterprise value over gross profit over revenue growth shows my usual metrics and what I use because I'm a hyper growth investor. So as a hyper growth investor, I typically invest in uh, the adoption of uh, the services or products that my stocks sell. Um, and that's why I use revenue growth as the main metric for, for that adoption, as a main proxy for that adoption. And I ask the question, how much am I paying for each percentage point of forward revenue growth? And, and, and this is enterprise value for gross profit revenue growth means I'm paying very, very cheap for a forward revenue growth of a company like Stoneco. Now, um, one, one of the, one of the things that, that, that really, um, has been coming back up on the channel is, you know, in the comment section once in a while, you have someone who will be a value investor and, you know, they won't understand my style of investing and, and, and they'll make some some snarky comments and, and, you know, my stocks are going to zero, etc. That's because we don't we don't speak the same language. I, I, I invest for adoption. I invest for the future. And a lot of value investor or value oriented investor, as I'm going to call them, invest for what what amount of money the business is making now. They invest for the now. And so why should we care about investing for the now? And in my view of accounting and my view of finance in general, investing for the now, caring about the now is represented by the EBITDA yield. Uh, because if we're in the 21st century, we're not in the 20th century. Uh, earnings have flaws that are well documented. And I don't think earnings should be used by anybody uh, today, uh, but I have, I have, I have, I have to make that very, very clear. Um, so, why should we care about? Let's call it a growth investor's metric of yield uh, today. Why, why should we care about that? Well, the answer for that is I really don't. I personally don't care about about EBITDA yield because I'm, I'm very clear about my type of investing. I invest in product adoption curves. Most of my investment returns will come from the change in the price to sales metric. A little bit of compression, sure, in price to sales over over a ten year period, you can see a little bit of compression in your price to sales. You may get to a seven, eight, down to like a five, but that's fine, right? I invest in that sales growth. I invest in revenue growth. But for value investors, you know, I think it's it's worth considering looking at EBITDA and EBITDA yield. Uh, and I say value investors who are not cynic, because and, and and this this kind of pisses me off because you see this all the time. You see this all the time. You see um, uh, old videos from Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett uh, making fun of EBITDA, and like every other month, you'll have EBITDA trending on, on on Twitter and people making fun of EBITDA. But EBITDA, in my view, is a much superior metric to earnings. Much 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 superior er metrics. EBITDA is similar to cash flow. First of all, if you say that EBITDA is not a good metric, right? Well, we have to understand that it's a good metric if you use EBITDA for all of your stocks. If you compare all of your stocks with the same metric, then it's all about the relative rank of your stock compared to your other stocks, right? You're not comparing EBITDA to earnings. You're comparing EBITDA to over EBITDA. So that starts with this. But then why is EBITDA better? EBITDA is much better because first of all, uh, taxes fluctuate. They greatly fluctuate from, from, uh, from quarter to quarter, from year to year, and based on the, the assets and the write downs, etc. Taxes fluctuate too much. If you take into account taxes, a company may have earnings that, that crash, and the cash flows are doing just fine. The earnings crash just because they put, I don't know, a billion dollar provision for a lawsuit that they may get once in a while. And, you know, CEOs should have an incentive. To minimize their earnings, because if you minimize your earnings, you minimize your taxes. So I think it makes a lot of sense to remove taxes out of the equation. Interest, let's be honest, interest makes a lot of sense to be removed because interest only matters, in my view, for very old school, high debt stocks. And, and, and really, the 21st century investor, the modern day growth investor, should understand the risk of long dated maturities and long dated debt, right? If you invest in utilities, do you see solar coming and do you see that most people are going to be producing electricity on your roof, right? If you invest in... Um, 
um, utilities such as internet providers like AT&T or Verizon? Do you, do you see Starlink coming? Do you see people switching to 5G and probably down the future people entirely moving away from internet, right? If you invest in any utility type stock, you're taking on insane fragility risk, insane risk of fragility, uh, as, we, as we've seen with so many utilities that I've went out of business. So interest, to me, it makes sense to entirely remove it because the modern corporation will be very, very wise with its debt, i.e. not have too much debt, because if you have too much debt, you become fragile and you're not immune to disruption. And then lastly, the DNA, depreciation and amortization. I am perfectly fine removing DNA from the cash flow because they are phantom expenses and fake expenses. They're absolutely fake expenses. And people who criticize EBITDA, they'll be like, what do you mean uh, depreciation is a, is a fake expense? You have to replace your equipment. Do you? Do you really, really have to replace your equipment if you do proper OPEX and proper maintenance every year, right? How many companies use equipment that is more than 100 years old? Look at industries such as, for example, the clothing industry how old the equipment is. Equipment can be very, very old. The, the biggest flaw in equipment is take your, take your traditional residential real estate company, for example, single family home where depreciation is 20, 27 and a half years is depreciation for a single family house. Let's say you do like a mom and pop rental business, 27 and a half years. Do you know a home that only lasts 27 and a half years? No, homes last w more than a hundred years. They last hundreds of years. You're, yet you're writing it off and depreciating in 27 and a half years. These are phantom expenses. They're a gift of the tax code and they should entirely be removed. Um, so that's why we should use EBITDA. I believe, I believe EBITDA is a much better metric than earnings. And, and P to me is, to me, P, P, they have, they have the nominators, which, which is crazy wrong. You use price of the stock, but you don't take into account debt. So you end up with companies, um, uh, anyway, anyways, you don't take into account debt. So you, you end up with companies that have a lot of debt being advantaged, in my view. So that's really bad. And then you use earnings, which is a metric that fluctuates all the time. Anyways, I love EBITDA. EBITDA is much better. And again, those who are non-cynical will see that, in my in my view, in my view. Um, and then B, and this is important. So assuming that EBITDA yield is a good thing, and, and we have our companies that yield an EBITDA, and let's say you have a company that would have an EBITDA yield of 30%, I'm just talking about theory here, but and you assume that the, own, the CEO is honest and able, right? That's from Warren Buffett, that quote I, I agree with, because if you invest for yield, if you invest for cash return, you have to trust the CEO, then it becomes very important to trust your CEO. So then in theory, an EBITDA yield of 30%, assuming that you have a trustworthy CEO, that EBITDA yield of 30% in theory should be equivalent theoretically, to a revenue growth of 30%, assuming in my, in my, st in my style of investing, I, I, am, I am assuming, but I know it's going to happen a little bit, but I am assuming no adjustments to the price to sell. I'm assuming very, very little compression in the price to sell, at least in the spreadsheets that I have. But, you know, if you're a value investor, you're assuming that the CEO is not going to squander the cash. And, you know, I, have, I often take a lot of issues with CEOs squandering cash. And sometimes they squander it in, in ways that are not apparent. Like, for example, if you have a lot of cash on the balance sheet and you do nothing with it, in my view, you're squandering it. You, you, are, you are paying an opportunity cost of not investing that money in your growth, right? So, so, so price to sales ratios compress over time. They, they reduce over time. But... The cash flow yield also is not going to be the actual yield that you achieve because the CEO is oftentimes going to engage in things that do not pay off one to one, right? So, but anyways, I, I, I theoretically they're very equivalent. EBITDA yield of thirty percent and revenue growth of thirty percent. If you if you remove the flaws of price to sales compression, if you remove the flaws of unhonest CEOs, dishonest CEOs, uh, theoretically they're equivalent, and so. Would it make sense to actually merge the two yields? Like if you were to merge the two yields, so you were to say a company like Stoneco, for example, is going to benefit from its revenue growth, and so price to sales is going to move up, but then it's also going to benefit from parking cash at 29% in their EBITDA yield. So the theoretical value creation for a company like Stoneco, for example, would be a 69%. 
And Pax Secura would be even higher at a 74% because Pax Secura is a company that is full on in harvest mode. And of course, you can probably explain much of the growth of Stone compared to Pax Secura. In fact, that Stone is investing heavily in its growth and Pax Secura is not investing as much in its growth. Right, but anyways, EBITDA is 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 is, is the bottom line, right? That's, that's what comes after, after investing in your growth is what you get. So, in theoretically, you should add it. And I would I would I would argue, um, if you add it, then you're compounding the assumption of no price compression, and you're compounding the assumption of no uh, wasting capital, not no waste of capital. And so when you compound these two assumptions, um, I believe it's too high. I, I believe that may not be the best way to do it of merging these two yields. A better way, in my view, to to look at the free cash flow uh, yield, and I'm using EBITDA as a proxy for free cash flow here. Uh, would be to look at it as a margin of safety. Because um, if you look at it as a margin of safety, then it's really going to help you in, in, in your investing. Because if the growth does not turn out to work, then the company is still producing cash flow and you still have hope that those cash flows will be returned to you in a way or another. So my proper order of looking at a stock, and 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 you you've probably seen that in all of my videos, where I, whenever I bring up a value metric, I bring it up last. It's like the last thing I bring up because that's that's due to my style of investing. Is I first look at whether the stock is getting adopted. Are we having big revenue growth? Are we having product adoption? Because if the service or product is good, in my view it is inevitable that it will follow that S-curve and get adopted. And, and that's the quote that I have here, which is bad managers don't kill great businesses. A great business is, I often take Steve Ballmer, Microsoft, always my example, but bad managers, if you have a really great business, bad managers, you know, they're going to have a hard time killing the, the great business because, because oftentimes all managers are, are pretty smart folks. They're, they're, they're pretty high up people. The difference is that you have one who's like first in their class and the second one who's like fifth in their class, right? So, so it's just like the difference between the best engineer and the second best engineer. The best engineer is worth so much more money than the second best engineer, but the second best engineer is still excellent. The same, the same way to think about that about CEO is, is the same thing here. So, so, so that's why I say bad managers, i.e. great managers, but not the greatest managers in the world, uh, don't kill great businesses, uh, in, my, in my view. Uh, Peter Lynch has another quote uh, relating to this, which is, buy a, business, buy, buy a business that could be run by a fool, because eventually a fool will. So that's the hope that your product gets adopted. And in the event that you, you get it wrong, you get revenue gr growth wrong, if you have free cash flows, right, uh, free cash flow yield, EBITDA yield that backs up that stock price, you can still hope to achieve your returns through that through that margin of safety of the cash flows, right? So let's say let's say you buy a stock for growth and you hope that there's going to be tremendous growth in that stock, and the growth does not turn out to be well. You would end up probably you may want to end up keeping that stock if that stock say dropped 70, 80 percent. You may want to end up keeping that stock because of the free cash flow yield and because that free cash flow yield is a backup. It's not what you invested in the stock first, but it's a backup for that stock. And I can think of a lot of Kathy Wood stocks that actually fit that criteria. When I think about Zoom, for example, Zoom's growth has stalled, but their free cash flow now acts as a back as a backup and really, really puts a floor on how low the stock can go. Um, but to me, investing in, in EBITDA yield is never the first reason to invest in a stock. It's always a, a secondary reason, a margin of safety. It's a plus, but it's not uh, it's it's not the thing that, that I seek. Um, and, 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 you know, in this spreadsheet, I have shown you a lot of stocks. I actually spent way more time working on this spreadsheet than I thought I would, because I thought I would find more stocks like, like Stoneco. And in fact, not a single stock out of one, two, three, four. I tried to go in different sectors. So out of these six over stocks, right, uh, none of them match my criteria for both. None of them match my criteria for EBITDA yield uh, and growth. It's always either great growth or great EBITDA yield. Like if you, even if you look at, at a company like Sam, Samler, which is a 
a device maker for detecting heart disease. Um, we have great EBITDA yield. We forward EBITDA yield next year EBITDA yield at 23%. That's great EBITDA yield. But the growth is, is, is to me, at 12% is, is, is a non-starter because that, that is less than monetary inflation. They're, they're, they're taking in less dollars each year than there are new dollars being issued. So to me, that's a, that's a no-go. Uh, Visa, I was... Um, pleasantly surprised to see that Visa is predicted to grow at 15%. Visa is obviously famous to be one of the most profitable companies out there. That's what Visa is known for. Uh, what you find if you look at Visa, you know, their EBITDA margin is 70%. <laughs> their gross margin is 97%, right? Visa is the king of rent seekers. It's a, it's a rent seeker so strong that Amazon, uh, Amazon can't say no to Visa. That's how strong uh, Costco doesn't say no to Visa. That's how strong that, that, that mode is. And, and, and of course, the risk is what, what if one day that, that, that mode goes away? Imagine, imagine the value destruction that you would get at the speed at which social trends spread today. Imagine if, if, if one day, one time, uh, people, people stop using Visa and they start using something else. Right? That's why I think it's always very risky to invest in, in moats and to count on moats to earning your outsized return. But this market is... is um, in my view, insane, highly overvalued for Visa. They only have 15% growth. You can see on my metric, enterprise value over gross profit over running growth. At, I'm at 1.13, so that's almost as expensive as NVIDIA in the way I value stocks for Visa. And then that yield is ridiculous at a, at a 4 and 5%. So that's that's less than the... Less than, tre less, than, less than treasury yields, you know, granted less risky probably than treasury yields oh, and over controversial statements. You, you got a lot of controversial statement watching this channel, right? I would much rather invest in a company whose product is getting adopted. In the way I, in the way I look at stocks, stocks that I find attractive here include Tesla and Phase. And, and Stoneco and Airbnb, but Airbnb, I'm done buying Airbnb right now because it's expensive. But 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 Stoneco, Stoneco, Tesla, and Enphase are very attractive to me because of those very high growth rates. Um, because I invest for product adoption and profits next, and so. There you go. That's the conclusion of this video. When I made this video, I was hoping I would find way more stocks that fit both sales growth over 30% and EBITDA yield over 30%. I have only found Stoneco. That's all I found. And in conclusion, if given a stock, I prefer to invest in product adoption than in invest investing for cash flow. My goal is to invest in a stock whose product gets adopted and you have 40% growth and then another 40% and over 40% and over 40% and over 40% and over 40%. And then 10 years later, maybe the growth moves from 40% one year to 20%. And that's my signal to start selling. Uh, that's been my style of investing for more than 10 years, and I've been very happy with it. Investing in mega trends, investing in the adoption of products. Anyways, this was not investment advice. This is just entertainment. I really was hoping to find more stocks today, uh, but no, just don't go. So not investment advice. Hope you like the video. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. I have a bunch of about, I think it's about 45%. 45% of my regular viewers are not subscribed to the channel. So I really appreciate if you subscribe because it, 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 it motivates me, right? It motivates me. My... Uh, my deadline of uh, October eight is coming up. I said I would uh, after one year. I would I would uh, I would assess whether YouTube was a good idea or not. So help me out with my deadline if you can subscribe, because that will definitely help me with my assessment as to whether I should continue YouTube or not. So, anyways, um, and follow me on X if you can beat the denominator. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful day.